Before we get started, please take the time to like, add, and subscribe to our pages on YouTube, Facebook, Spotify, and iTunes. Also, please leave us a review. So to me, this baffles me because you could, you could enter a country, commit murder, get back on your sailboat, get to another island. The country wouldn't even know that you had set foot on the island. Like how? We can wander our way over, you know, because this is wandering ways. What's Bigfoot possibility? Link. Link. Click clack, clickety clack. What's up, everybody? Welcome. It is another wonderful Wednesday with the Wandering Ways crew on the Wandering Ways podcast. I am the first wanderer here, the Reverend Ulbrich. And with me as Whoa. per you, the Whoa. second Whoa. wanderer. I don't know what we're wanting. I haven't even introduced this guy's always interrupting, but it is Ranger Zach. How we doing? Who deemed you the first wanderer? I did. Since I edit, I do the intros. I do all that. I get to be the first. Oh, I thought you're gonna be well because I'm older. <laughs> oh no, no. Fair, fair. And I did um, hear you updated the new commercials. So there's a good yeah, change. We have, some, we have some new commercials out there. You know, might as well make them uh, different these days. Change them up, change them up. But no, man, I'm good. Ranger Zach is happy, living life, living large. Look at this. Just a little insider. I just went to the mailbox um, and I pulled out my new magnet uh, kind of mounts, right? So this one goes to a tripod, okay? Like I have a little metal plate on the back of my phone so I can mount it to a tripod. if I want the tripod or this one's a double magnet. So like I can mount it to the Jeep or something, Ah, but definitely thinking of you guys to see some content. I don't know. There we go. He's always, always thinking about that kind of stuff, you know, cause I mean, it's not like there's any big trips in the future or anything like that. So, Oh, um, Shocker. Sorry. Speaking of big trips, Iceland alert. Um, Here's a little tip, pro tip to the wanderers. So my camera lens, the wide angle, right? It was broken. Jared took it into Bozeman camera. They said the clutch slipped. Um, It's going to, you know, it would just be better to buy a new one is what they said than repair it. I thought about taking it into Portland. Didn't. Instead, I talked about that on eBay, sold the lens on eBay, used that money for a new lens. And it really only cost me like 60 bucks difference when you, when you break it down. And I was like, you know what? Like that's less than like a repair would have been. So tip for the wise, sometimes you could sell it. Sell stuff that doesn't work. That's always the best way to go. Well, Uh, you can do that for parts and stuff on cameras. And like, I'm sure there's some photo genius out there that could fix a clutch slip. You know what I mean? Oh, I know. I'm just giving you a hard time. (laughs) I know you are. You're, you're selling a broken item on eBay. Hey, Um, I sold socks on eBay, used socks on eBay. Everybody's got something that they're into. Um, (laughs) But (laughs) yeah, no, I, you know, and the, some people aren't into that, and they're into the Wandering Ways podcast, <laughs> and they're into nature, <laughs> and they're in for a treat today. Because I, you know, I was I was caught surprised by our guest Vicky today, um, and sh- she just said one day I'm going to live at sea. And yeah, that's kind of wild in all reality. Like, go for it. I'm curious. I I should have pried a little more. So maybe Vicky will have to hit you up on your socials um, to kind of know what you do for work more, because like to be able to do that, like digitally, that's cool. Like to be able to travel to all these islands and just live life and work and enjoy life. 
in the way you want to enjoy it. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's really cool what she does. It, you know, this one, this interview, while being an absolute treat and a half of an interview that we did, uh, if you would have asked me way back, um, you know, 133 episodes ago, right? So right at the beginning of this puppy or when we were first thinking about it, if you were to ask me or even tell me, right, that one of these days you're going to interview someone who pretty much lives on a boat in the Caribbean and is a digital nomad, I would turn to you and I would say, ha, nah, I just, uh, I never would have fathomed uh, getting someone like this. So I mean, it's, it's what makes this, this so, so special of an interview really, because it's a cool story. And I never would have thought, I didn't even really imagine a lot of people did this. Um, so being able to talk to someone who is doing it, is an absolute pleasure. Well, and you've lived on a boat in the summers in Alaska, so you kind of understand to know what it's like. Um, w- would you ever consider a life like this? Living on no, no, I wouldn't. <laughs> that's a quick. That's a quick, quick answer. <laughs> no, um, you, you know, and I think part of it is, well, you know, like she was saying. You have to really enjoy the good parts of it because it will make those bad parts um, so, you know, easier to get through. And, you know, living on the boat up in Alaska for me for the six weeks at a time, you know, maybe it was that because of the experience I had, I went up there for work, you know, I'm working the fish fish life fisherman lifestyle for the six weeks type deal you know uh, i don't know what the good times are when you're up there <laughs> so right um you know maybe it's more if i tried sailing or something like that you know maybe it would change but due to the experience i've had it's not i don't think it would be for me fair no that's definitely fair i I'm not, you know, I like boats, maybe not so much on the ocean um, in that sense. I have my little yellow boat, you know, my grandpa gave it to me while I bought it from him. And we uh, we haven't taken it out yet. You and I, um, you saw it up there at Sealy, but it didn't touch it didn't touch no waters. Nope, 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 nope. Uh, I mean, I do love the ocean. I do absolutely love the ocean so uh i'm jealous that she can just wake up take four steps and jump in it um so uh that is very cool but no um i don't want to spoil too much of this interview because there's so many awesome things in it uh so we're we're just gonna kind of uh you, you know make sure to hit her up on uh all the social medias it's her first name last name I'm going to apologize. I do not know how to pronounce uh, Vicky's last name, so I don't want to butcher it that bad. I butcher simple names, so complicated ones. I'm going to even do an even worse job. So, um, But, yeah, make sure you check her out on all of her socials, and um, make sure you give this whole podcast a listen or this whole interview a listen because it's a hoot and a half of treat and a half a pleasure and a half it's everything and a half and more so that being said let's uh let's meet vicky hey hey there reverend um i heard that you might be running dry on your sticker supplier yeah i've been looking around and i've kind of like run out of cool stickers to buy and put on water bottles and stuff well, I, I mean, have you seen the stuff Josh has been coming out with lately? No, I have not. Well, he is doing some really cool stuff with the Shop LS574. Yes, they're working with indigenous communities and making some really cool stickers. Um, he has a really cool Buffalo Mountain sticker. There's even water bottles, hats, sweatshirts, the whole swag. And we even got 
a discount code for you guys. Yes, if you use Wandering Ways at Shop LS574, you're going to be getting a discount on your next purchase. But not only that, you're going to be giving a percentage of that sale to the Little Shell Tribe, as well as they donate a dollar of every sale to murdered and missing Indigenous women. So just such a cool thing going on there. You know, you use the code Wandering Ways. W-A-N-D-E-R-I-N-G, W-A-Y-S, and you put that in there, boom, you're getting a discount. All righty, we are super, super excited. Uh, we have an awesome guest on here today. We have Vicki, and she has some stories to tell. Um, so to kind of just get things going, uh, Vicki, if you want, just kind of introduce yourself kind of like let uh, the people listening just kind of know what you're doing a little bit and then we'll kind of roll from there all right awesome thank you thank you mark and thank you for having me so my name is vicky i'm a canadian who just escaped the cold canadian winters <laughs> to live uh full-time in the caribbean i'm currently living on a beautiful 30 feet sailboat which i own uh, with my partner and I work online, so I'm a digital nomad, and I help other entrepreneurs build and scale their remote-based business. Nice. Um, I, the first question I really have, and it's the moment that I kind of heard your story, I've been wanting to know um, kind of this answer, but what inspired you to leave Canada and to live on a boat and become this digital nomad? Okay, awesome. I had this moment uh, about four years ago, a little bit, almost five years now, where I went on a chartered trip to the Bahamas. So a chartered trip is when you rent a boat with a captain, for those listening who don't know. And um, I just remember being on this boat, and then we went spear fishing for a day, and we got fish, and then the captain opened it up on a rock on the beach, and we got back on the boat, and we made sushi, fresh sushi, out of the fish we just caught. And that was the moment for me. We were on a sailboat with a beautiful sunset in the Bahamas, turquoise water, eating sustainably food we had just caught ourselves. And my brain exploded. I was like, okay, this is the life for me. This is the life that I want. I've been a swimmer and a scuba diver for many, many years. So I'm obviously, I love the ocean. I'm a very good, you know, free diver, all of that. But this was just taking my love for the ocean to a whole new level. And so I came back home knowing nothing about boats, nothing about sailing, nothing about diesel mechanics, meteorology, electricity, and just announced uh, my to my whole family and friends that I was about to move on a boat. So as, as that's like happening, are you looking up like the cost of boats in the same sense people look up like the cost of a house? Like, okay, if I do this, I get this loan, I can do this for this. Wow. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I started looking for how much is a boat? Uh, what do you need to learn to be on a boat? Who does, who, what kind of people live on boats? And then looking these people up, meeting with those people, going to like the sailing fair. And then it was really funny, actually, when I took up sailing in the summer in Quebec, they paired me with a summer camp for kids. So I was with three little boys on a, on a 16 but sailboat and they were all like 12 and 13 year olds and there I was like 25 learning how to sail it was the cutest um <laughs> well, that's funny so yeah you really and I bet you're just like I hope nothing bad goes wrong I don't want to be in charge of these little kids like <laughs> yeah well most of them were better than me at that point <laughs> Oh, you know, nice. they've been doing sailing camp all summer I was only there for a week so they were a lot better than me <laughs> So That's wild. what does it take as you say, so you went to like a sailing camp, uh, I guess what, what all does it take? Do you need to be certified? Yeah. Like, yeah. So there are different laws, um, around the world. There are different like things that you need to have in terms of sailing. Some of the mandatory one is just a regular boat license, license, boating license, which is the same. You need to drive like, a a sea do or, okay. um, a motorboat. Um, that's pretty easy to do. You can even like do the whole course and take the exam online. Another thing that is mandatory is get a VHF radio uh, permit. 
because in order to operate a radio, you need to be certified. And as long as you're, I mean, not as long, sorry, as soon as you are, um, I think it's 20 miles from the coast, you need to have one of those on board. Um, so that would definitely a course that I had to do. And then these are the only mandatory per se things. But then, of course, if you hope to insure your boat, you want to have as much knowledge and as much certification and as much experience as you can um, to be able to prove to the insurance people that you know what the hell you're doing. Oh, wow. Yeah, I'm sure they that. Yeah, that's I didn't even think, you know, that's something you don't even think about. But yeah, that's a cost that they're probably like. Yeah, no, it's going to be your deductibles this much. Like, sorry, you have no experience. You're going to sink this ship. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, is that radio, is it used for like safety measures? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's what you used to like call for a mayday or a pan pan or call for help or call it if you see another boat coming at you and you want to know what their intentions are. That's how you communicate. It's kind of like the same for planes right? They have a certain like codes to learn. You have to learn a specific alphabet. Um, So, yeah. Uh, Well, I guess leading into that, uh, I'm hoping you haven't had any run-ins with pirates or anything. Oh, so the thing with pirate stories, and they are, they are pirate stories. We've been very lucky so far. We've been on the water for nine months and no sighting of pirates. Okay. Um, but we've come to the conclusion that people recycle pirate stories. Like it's the same pirate story that everybody tells in the Caribbean. So maybe there was one pirate incident in the last four years, but everybody keeps saying the story. So it makes us feel like they're very present. Um, <laughs> I've heard the worst stories, to be honest, about pirates more around like Thailand, Vietnam, Indonesia. I've heard some scary stuff. Um, like so what? yeah, we try to... The worst one I've heard was uh, someone who the pirates boarded his boat, shaved his head, removed all of his clothes and dropped him in a dinghy and left with his boat. So he he like rode with his little floating boat to land, arrived there naked with his head shaved with no papers and had to go to like an embassy. Oh, my gosh. That would be terrible. Yeah, that's the worst story I've heard. (laughs) Yeah, that would be, that would not be a fun time. <laughs> well, that would definitely, I mean, that's definitely a danger, you know, and you, you know, you are traveling internationally and whenever you are traveling internationally, that's something you, you just, you got to be privy to, there's people out there who are going to take advantage of you because they think they can, um, no matter where you're at in this world, no matter who you are. So you just got to be careful. You always got to, you know, kind of keep a, keep a watch out. Um, what other, I guess, dangers come with the territory of living on a boat? Yeah. Oh, my God. There, there are many dangers. Um, I just want to add something to what you're just saying now. And it's that what's tricky about the water is that it is in between countries, right? It's not on a certain country. There's going to be certain rules. There's going to be police. But in between countries, there's kind of this gray zone where anything could happen, And we've had like certain Caribbean islands that are not as organized when it comes to customs and immigration. So for example, when we got to St. Lucia the first time, so I think it was back in December, we arrived in, we cleared it at customs. So customs is the belongings, right? It's the boats, it's the objects that enter the country. Immigration is the humans. And for whatever reason, immigration guy was not there that day. So they were like, yeah, yeah, it's fine. It's fine. You'll, you just, you'll get your paper when you check out. So to me, this baffles me because you could, you could enter a country, commit murder, get back on your sailboat, get to another Island. The country wouldn't even know that you had set foot on the Island. Like yeah, how it's... crazy is that? That is wild. I never even thought or fathomed that kind of idea of like, you know, there's, there's no paper trail for you. So you literally just hop on, commit a, a major crime and then you're bouncing out. <laughs> That's kind of, I never really, really would have thought of that. Yeah. So some countries, some countries you're allowed to stay, your boat can dock in the Bay, but you cannot go on land unless it's to do your clearance to do customs and immigration. Some countries you have 48 hours So you can go on land, have dinner, interact with people, and you're not even technically in the country legally yet. Um, So every country is kind of different and we're learning to learn all of these rules and everything. And it's a lot of it is kind of like folkloric, like folklore. Uh, Every time 
you are in a country, you're going to have a courtesy flag, which is a flag of the country you're in. When you arrive at a new country, you're going to bring down that flag and bring up a yellow flag, which is a quarantine flag. And once you're done your clearance, you're going to put a yellow flag on, uh, sorry, you're going to put the the flag of the new country that you arrived in to prove that you're done your clearance. And um, while we were, I think it was still St. Lucia, we forgot to put the St. Lucian flag just because, you know, it's a, it's a tiny detail. We did our clearance. We went for shopping. We came back. We did not put the flag and the Coast Guards came to us. Oh. And they were like yelling because obviously you're both on boats. So you're trying to communicate. Right. They were young us. I was like, yeah, yeah, we did clear and we did our clearance yesterday. So sorry. But it's funny, you know, we could have just not done our clearance and put the flag up and they never would have they never would have come and asked about our boat. Um yeah. so it's all these funny little details. But yeah, I don't know if you want to talk about more about that, but I have more dangers about boat life coming up. So. I'm all for it. <laughs> I don't know about yeah. that. Um, before we go into the other dangers, I'm kind of curious. It's got to be challenging to know the different like rules when you're entering these different islands or countries. So I'm more so curious if you have like an ongoing list of like, all right, because we've been here, this is what we need to do type deal. Or are you, is there like a book or some sort? Because I, I mean, knowing myself, I think I would get very overwhelmed with all the different like rules and customs on getting in and in, into these countries. Yes. So when we purchased the boat, it actually came with several sailing and cruising books. Uh, so I highly recommend getting like some of them are not up to date. So definitely get some cruising books. We'll have all of these information for each of the countries and even like uh, where is the clearance because islands are very big and sometimes there's only one or two places to do clearance. Uh, so if you anchor in a bay that's super far, you end up paying a super expensive taxi to get to the other end of the island to do your clearance. So these books will also tell you which bays are good to anchor in, which bays are free. Um, so definitely do that. And then most people nowadays use Facebook groups. So there are Facebook groups for cruising in the Caribbean, cruisers in St. Lucia, cruisers in Martinique, cruisers in Grenada. And then a lot of people will just ask, hey, where is the clearance? How does it work? Um, so you have a really beautiful, tightly knit community around you supporting you. Oh, cool. That's nice to have. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, so I guess when you're out when you're not docked on the island uh i'm assuming you have a hot spot if you're able to check out like these space but well also as a digital nomad um i'm assuming you have a a hot spot of some sort um out there that's and it works well yeah 100 percent. i mean first of all we don't have it but now starlink works really mm-hmm. well starlink for boats as well oh. Google yeah. Fi, if you're in the States, like there's lots of options. In the Caribbean so far, the best option we've found is with Digicel in Martinique. It really has to be in Martinique. I don't know why it cannot be purchased anywhere else, but you can purchase a Caribbean card in Martinique and it works on most Caribbean island, oh, wow. um, all the way down to Grenada and up north. I think it's up to St. Martin's and it's about a hundred gigs of data for 30 euros per month. So That plus like Wi-Fi from cafes. Right now I'm in an Airbnb. Uh, I have a friend visiting me. So she rented an Airbnb because she's terrified of boats. Um, (laughs) Doesn't want to stay on my boat for the week, which is fair. So I'm enjoying her Wi-Fi right now. But yeah, there are tons of options now. You know, the, the world has changed since COVID. And every time we travel, because we've traveled before getting on the boat as well, we're always looking for um, what the internet situation is like before we fly or sail or walk or bus there right so have you been a digital nomad like before this uh boat venture or um did you pick it up because you wanted to work on the boat or live on the boat sorry Uh, i did i did pick it up i did started doing digital work because i wanted to live on a boat but when we purchased the boat it was just the beginning of hurricane season so we had kind of a four months before actually starting our boating life so we traveled for those four months we went to um south korea for a month stayed in europe for a bit then did a small like road trip canada united states and then we flew to trinidad and tobago which is where we met our boat for the first time put her up in shape put her in the water she was on the hard and then started her sailing journey wow so when you you say hurricane season so 
when it comes to that, because that, that happens essentially every year, do you, do you, you're not on the boat, I assume, in the Caribbean, or are you docked in islands, or how do what, I guess, how does that work? <laughs> yeah, uh, for us, we really, really love Trinidad and Tobago, so we just haul out, um, yeah, we take the boat out of the water for three, two or three months, we fly back home, see our friends and family for a bit, and then fly back to the boat, or or travel to another place or, you know, possibilities are, are endless. Some people stay on their boat all year round. They just sail below hurricane lines or higher than hurricanes, hurricane lines. Like for example, some people will sail up to Canada every summer and then sail back down to the Caribbean every winter. Um, but these people, a lot of them, they live the way that they make a living. Sorry. The way they earn their money is moving boats around or is charters or whatever. For us, it would be hard because we have, <laughs> both me and my partner have a full-time job, so we can be sailing six days a week to go all the way up North. Uh, yeah. We kind of have to jungle, you know, juggle, sorry, with sailing life, uh, traveling and work all at the same time. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And that's, hard. that's probably a hard balance. Um, in, you know, when you think about it, because being on a boat, you know, it's not just, it's not like a car where it's like, yeah, just go like, and you say a sailboat, so you're using a sail. So you got to move this mass with this wind and this, and you got to know the wind, you got to know the stars, um, which I met, I bet, you know, we're big star people up here. I know Mark's always, when we talk about national parks, he's like, which one's a dark sky park? So I'm sure you get some pretty good stars out on the Caribbean being where you're at as well. So to use those as a map, have, have you been in a situation where you had to use them as that way? Um, unfortunately, yes. Oh, no way. Uh, we, I did not finish the, um, astronomical navigation course. I started it back in Canada. I did not finish it because of COVID. I think it was like an in-person course and we all went back home or something like that. Um, but we had to, so in November, our diesel engine broke, which is the inboard engine. And then we were stuck in Grenada for, I think six weeks and we really wanted to move up North and no one was able to fix our motor in Grenada. So we took the reckless decision to sail up to Martinique with no engine and it's doable for like experienced sailors. I don't think we're experienced sailors yet. I think people who've been sailing for 50 years are experienced sailors. Um, so we had no engine and we left on this journey. So we had been sailing at this point for three nights and three days. Um, we we're in pretty rocky conditions, about 25 knots of wind. So that's 50 kilometer an hour wind in your face. We um, had two meter waves. Wow. Um, some of the elements on the boat broke. So I had the two sheets of the front sail that ripped out. So I had to go up on the bow of the boat in the two meter waves, trying to tie back the ropes <laughs> onto the onto the sail and then the winch broke the lifeline broke everything was just breaking which is kind of normal for boats by the way like everything is broken on a boat you just don't know it yet and just <laughs> right. the way it is cruising is just fixing your boat in exotic places that's what cruising is just if you don't know <laughs> about boats uh so you can kind of see the picture and we had a crew member at this point that we had taken to kind of help us for this tricky sail and possibly help us get some sleep because, you know, three days, we knew it was going to take between like three and eight days to get there with no engine. So it would have been nice to have an extra, an extra hand, but the crew got super seasick. So the crew was just lying on the floor in front of the only door to the bathroom. So we had to pee and poop overboard in the two meter waves um all we've been eating is chips and ramen um not brushing your teeth just no personal hygiene nothing and then that is the moment <laughs> where our batteries uh died our solar panel for whatever reason stopped recharging our batteries and so the ipad died all of our phones had no more batteries our chart plotter died so we had no more sailing instruments no more way to know which course we were on, where we were according to land, um, how we were going to get home. <laughs> we just had one VHF, portable VHF that still had battery in it. So we knew that we could ask for help. But at this point, our last latitude and longitude 
was 50 miles, which is 100 kilometers off of the coast of St. Vincent. And that means that if we used our VHF radio now, no one would hear or cry for help. Uh, so we first had to get closer to land before we could ask for help. So that's when we used paper maps and the stars in order to get as close as we could to any freaking islands. <laughs> Wow. Um, and then we use the VHF radio to call Coast Guards for a towing. That's got to be scary. I mean, I would be, I would be scared. <laughs> yeah, it it was. <laughs> Were like, you questioning your whole decision to do the whole boat, living on the boat life uh, during that time? Not, you don't have time for that. When you're in this kind of life or death moment situation you don't have time to question your decision you just want to freaking survive you want a warm meal you want to shower you want to you want this to work you kind of become in this survival mode where you don't question why did I decide to go walk in the forest today you just want to make it and you know about 12 hours later I think someone someone relayed our message to the coast guards and we got towed into this beautiful island Canawan and this ridiculously luxurious marina where we were not even allowed to dry our clothes around the boat because it doesn't look professional. Oh, and to, just to give you an idea of how luxurious this marina was. So four hours after that, I'm fully showered. I'm wearing a beautiful dress and I'm drinking a pina colada on the beach. And my partner and I are debriefing about this sail. And we're like, what the hell just happened? And we're just grateful to be alive and happy and yeah, our priority was to fix our boat up and, and continue at that point. Wow. And you just keep going because you love what you do. Yeah, we freaking love it. I mean, I think yeah. my dream as a kid, my dream as a kid was to become a treasure hunter, you know, like National Treasure, the movie, or like Indiana Jones. Like I wanted to be yeah. one of those cool archaeologist people who have like badass adventures. And I think sailing is like the closest I've felt to that feeling of like doing stuff that I don't know. I I impressed myself. <laughs> well, well, you said you scuba dive. So, have you tried to explore any shipwrecks or anything like that in the area? Just because? Uh, no, not yet. Actually, that's super sad. The only time we scuba dove in the Caribbean so far was to retrieve something. So here's the story. Oh, no. While we were in Grenada, trying to get our engine fixed, not being successful. Um, we were having a really rough day. We were repairing a bunch of stuff on the boat. We were also having some electricity troubles. I had to go up the mast, fix up the electricity. So I was super tired and my partner wants to help out and he decides to clean our compost toilet and he accidentally dropped the toilet in the sea. So he woke me up and he's like, Hey, I'm so sorry, honey. I lost our toilet. And so um, we borrowed scuba gear and we dove and we retrieved our toilet. And now, mm. now we have one again. So that was my so only scuba diving story. <laughs> oh, no. Well, hopefully you get to do some in this uh, in the upcoming, you know, months or if you, I don't know. <laughs> that would be great. Um, so yeah. ro rolling around the Caribbean there, have you come to some favorite islands like you did talk about like a luxury marina does that fit into like some of your top places to go or what uh i guess what are your recommends oh it really depends what you like um it depends some islands i loved because of the lifestyle sorry not the lifestyle the nightlife some islands because of the food some islands because of the water I have to say like St. Vincent and the Grenadines has the most beautiful turquoise water. It's similar to the Bahamas. Um, Martinique obviously has like the infrastructure of Europe, of France, which is very different. It's a Caribbean island where you can get stuff done if you need to get your boat fixed. If you need to get boat parts, it's going to happen a lot quicker. Um, Grenada had a lot of social activities, a lot of fun nature also, beautiful waterfalls. That was great. Trinidad has some of the best food in the world. Uh, Trinidad and Tobago was like colonized and had people from so many different cultures. So you'll find amazing Indian food, African food, Caribbean food, Creole food, all of that. Um, and it was also much cheaper than the other islands. So if you want to eat really good for cheap, Trinidad is the way to go. Also, Trinidad has beautiful biodiversity. People forget, but it has a higher 
uh, biodiversity than um, like species per area than Brazil. Oh, wow. So wow. For, yeah, for bird watching and all that, Trinidad and Tobago is just absolutely amazing. Wow. Yeah, I had actually heard, I've heard good things about Trinidad and Tobago. Um, I'm just, I don't know, I've never, I, it's never crossed my mind to really go and visit, but I have heard fantastic things about it. Yeah, no, the only thing I heard was from Matt Buddy. He met some girl on Mash.com from there. Yeah. He was, he was, it's uh, a beautiful accent. It's yeah. a crazy, yeah. it's like a sensual, soft. I love the Trini accent. It has something to it. And I mean, carnival, you got to live that once in your life. Like Trinidad carnival is insane. I wasn't there for, for carnival. I was here in Martinique for Martinique carnival, um, which is also very cool. But I think Trinidad takes it to a whole other level. Well, yeah, that's actually one thing Matt did say he did. Cause he's like, it's like the real one. It's almost as good. They say as, as Rio's. Yeah. Which I mean, yeah. And the, the, I've been fortunate enough to actually meet um, people from Trinidad and Tobago, actually, actually here in uh, the U S and Oregon, uh, cause they had the world championships for track up in uh, Eugene and there are some Trinidad and Tobago and, um, like runners in this event. And, you know, they're the fans from all over the world. They come and they support their country like no other. Mm-hmm. And man, <clears throat> these two guys with the Trinidad and Tobago flag, they were going nuts. And like we, the group I was with just loved everything about them. So we were, we picked our winner, winner for that. Like he, we were like, we want this guy to like <laughs> him to go. Cause we were just all about it, but they're super nice people, you know, the, that we met and you know, that's fortunate when you're at like a big athletic event, you're going to probably meet the um, nicest people there, but I'm almost certain just because from my travels that they're the people are probably not far off there in the country themselves in Trinidad and Tobago. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah. No, they're, they sure, they, they know how to party. That's for sure. <laughs> um, yeah. so, so one of the questions I do have for you is when you were starting out, what is some of the advice you wish you would have given yourself or if you have for others trying to start these journeys? Um, awesome. Do you mean sailing specifically? Or living on a boat, I guess, too, kind of both. Okay, Sailing and live aboard life. Uh, first thing I want to say is if you have a boat that is anywhere under $60,000, um, be ready to invest about the same amount in repairs within the first two years. Um, yeah, definitely learn as much as you can about mechanic and electricity before you get there, because that will save you hundreds of dollars and will make you feel a lot more confident that you can um, keep your boat in shape. Um, do not purchase secondhand dinghies. I think that's the biggest mistake we made. Um, every time someone asks me if I have any regrets in my life, I'm like, yeah, buying secondhand dinghies. So those are like the little, um, it's like our car, right? It's what we use when we want to get from our sailboat to land. And we just have terrible dinghy adventures where we purchased two secondhand dinghies and ended up investing tons of dollars to fix them and they were never good enough and we'd wake up in the morning and they would deflate and our outboard would be underwater which broke our outboard uh we ended up one day we were trying to go to land and the whole floor of one dinghy just fell so we were like trying to retrieve our bags our dry bags with our computers the oars parts of the floor while holding on to our floating duck so it's been a real mess. So yeah, definitely. Now we've purchased a brand new thing. I think it costs us $4,000, but it is like a Cadillac of dinghies. Everybody <laughs> wants rides in our dinghies now, in our dinghy now. Um, so yeah, don't be afraid to invest in a good dinghy. Like that's your comfort. That's how you get to land. Uh, get couples therapy before you go. <laughs> because, <laughs> uh, because living in a, such a small space, even if you love your significant other, you're going to need to have strategies and tools to be able to communicate, communicate in emergency situations, communicate when 
you just need some space. Uh, invest in really good noise canceling headphones so that when you do want some alone time, it is possible. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. No, those are all good recommendations for sure. Um, you got anything for like just general like boat life? You know, is it? I don't know if you've done like much like you know van life is very popular right now, and I kind of in my head I kind of picture you know van life to what you're doing in the Caribbean as being the same, just the difference is solid land to water essentially and so i'm curious if you have any tips um for just like general living on the boat um, yeah. for like yourself there i think that yes van life and boat life are very similar uh i also think they're very different in a sense that we have a lot more safety precautions than a van does every time we leave at sea we're putting our lives at risk we risk falling overboard. Whereas yes, you can get a car accident in a van, but I don't feel like it's as, it doesn't feel the same amount of risk. Um, also with a van, unless you have like big mechanical problems, which maybe happens more often that I'm assuming, um, you can kind of pretty much pick up and leave whenever you want on a boat. You're fully dependent on the weather. Sometimes like my partner and I have had four days off. We're super ready and stoked to sail but out there in the ocean, the currents on the wind are like, nope, you're staying at anchor this weekend. So wow. we can't. And sometimes it's like, oh, my God, there's an amazing weather window. We're getting some good easterly winds on Thursday. We got a clearer day. Cancel all of our meetings and leave now if you want to catch this weather window. So you really need to be in touch with the elements, the nature, the water, the tides, the currents, the winds. Um, like we're checking we're checking the weather on the daily every morning we have our little routine we look at the depressions the winds that are coming we look at the map and kind of see what is the prediction for the next seven days um so that's definitely a big part and then of course if you're not in love with it if you're moving on a sailboat for someone else you're going to quit you're going to quit because everything takes longer on a sailboat um, you know, going to do your laundry, going to do your groceries, you know, you park your van in a parking lot of a grocery store, you walk in and you grab your fruits, you bring them back to your van. For me, I need to like, take my dinghy to shore, find out where the grocery store is. Oh my God, I need to take a bus, take a bus, take my groceries, take the bus back, take my dinghy back to my boat. And then, oh no, it's raining. So you're with your groceries and your dinghy and it's raining on you and you're getting to your boat, you know? Yeah. Um, so everything is, takes more time. You need to be so patient. And then there's the rocking. You know, that's that's too. In a van, at least at night or in the evening, you can have a nice dinner, watch the sunset. And like you said, it's flat. Uh, for me, sometimes a speedboat passes by me and my whole pot of pasta goes on the floor and I have pasta all over my cushions on my floor and, uh, you know, hot water everywhere. And that happens eggs the other day I broke a dozen of eggs in the middle of my boat and then you don't have a central vacuum <laughs> you know how do you yeah. how do you clean that up that takes time once again um so yeah I would say the, the rocking is a big thing some nights it's so rocky that we can't sleep some nights it's super calm and we have the best sleep is just like being in your mom's belly you're being gently rocked and mm -hmm. other nights it's like everything's cracking all the ropes are hitting the mast ding 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 and you're like oh my god it's been two days, two days. i have to get to work <laughs> um so you really have to be in love with the good aspects to be able to get through the the hard ones well and i'm sure like you said you have those facebook groups and whatnot too that help out find those bays that are more calm for sleeping and working <laughs> Versus like, yeah, like you said, you I'm sure you pulled up to some bays where, yeah, this is a traffic zone at 4 a.m. <laughs> yeah, not yeah, we had that in Beckway. In Beckway, when we didn't have a working motor, some of her friends picked us up from a mooring ball and they like tied their boat to ours and drove with us to anchor us beside them. But then we were right by a floating bar. And then the next day, our friends left and we just dropped anchor there. But then we had no way to move, but we were right by this floating bar for a whole month. So there were parties every night, super loud music, and we could not move our boat. 
Um, so that was a rough month, but we got through it. We're here now. Oh my gosh, I can only imagine that. Yeah, that would be quite annoying. Uh, is the is the weather uh, fairly stable, or does it like just flip on a dime uh, for you guys? Like you know, you'll look, everything seems good, and then just all the, a pressure system comes out of nowhere or something. Or is it just fairly kind of just stable, easy, easy to kind of predict and um, plan out with it? Yeah, I would say when you're close to land, it's pretty easy to predict, as you mentioned. Um, it rains pretty much every day in the Caribbean. Even like even when people say it doesn't, it does, but it's really short. It's going to be like 15 minutes intense rain and then it's going to be over. So that's for rain. Um, and then, yeah, for the rest, it's pretty easy to predict. But when you're out at sea, then you always get surprises. It's not always exactly what was predicted. Exactly. And then you have gusts. So sometimes for one hour, like I'll always remember, we have a satellite phone that sends our position every 20 minutes to our family when we're sailing just for safety. Um, and um, yeah, at one point, my dad called me after one of the sails and he was like, what happened between there and there? And we just had a super big gust of wind and our boat went flying. She was going wow. faster than ever before. We're going at like eight knots, which is really fast for a boat that size. Wow. Uh, so that was some good sailing. So we don't know where that came from. That was not on the prediction, but sometimes magical stuff happens out there. So you said that your family tunes into your location. How have they adjusted to you doing this lifestyle as well as how, like, how, I guess, how does that work? Yeah. Um, my dad was pretty stoked about it. He, he's been sailing on and off as, you know, for a good part of his life. He's also a water person, just like me, loves the outdoors, loves adventures. He's a big, um, ice climber. You should get, you guys should invite him. He'd have great yeah, stories for you. We'd love it. <laughs> um, so yeah, he's the, uh, he loves like ice climbing and like, winter camping and stuff like that he's a big adventurous guy so he came for three weeks in September to help us fix up the boat and kind of see what she looks like and give us his his advice um and then he's been following all of my sales like before every sale I send him uh, our itinerary our estimated time of arrival um and all the information I can and then after the sale I always send him like our average speed the, the distance we covered and then he follows us as well on the satellite phone um, my parents are separated probably because my mom is not an adventurous person so she would not have been able to follow him and uh she I don't tell her when I sail I just oh. don't tell her I tell her when I've arrived I'm like hi right. mom I'm now in Martinique <laughs> um so no she doesn't she doesn't after the, the four day one yeah she worries after the the longest one we did which was four days and a half um, she called my dad because she was like, I haven't heard of my daughter for a couple of days. Is that normal? <laughs> and then he had to break break it down to her that we were currently being towed by the Coast Guards and everything. Oh um, no. Yeah, mommy was not happy, but it's okay. <laughs> Aside from that, everyone's everyone's kind of happy for me, happy that I'm going after my dream. And my little sister was here just last week, okay. spending a week with me on the boat, and she absolutely loved it as well. Oh, good. That's good. So it's good that you're able to do that. You're not just, you're a, almost able to resume your normal life, you know, pre-COVID in that sense of like traveling, you can see people whenever. Yeah. Yeah, that's, exactly. That's neat. Now, um, I guess when you're in, I, I've never been to the the Caribbean, the Bahamas, those, the, all the islands in that area. Um, I assume there's islands that aren't inhabited by people as well. And are you able to go to some of these or are there, so there are some of those spots as well that are able to check out? Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. There's a lot of them in the Bahamas, uh, all of the Exumas you can visit, you know, there's the, an Island that has a bunch of pigs. Maybe you've seen that on the internet. Oh. They just don't have any predators. So it's an Island covered with pigs <laughs> and tourists go there to take photos. There's an Island covered with lizards as well. Like an insane amount of lizards. Um, but yeah, it's pretty, it's not really regulated. So even here, like off of the Grenadines, um, between like Canawan, Beckway, and Mystique, um, 
we just anchored and then took our little dinghy close to a deserted island, dropped the anchor of the dinghy, swam to the shore, because sometimes the shores are very rocky, lots of rocks. You don't want to bring your dinghy on there and break it. And then you just kind of explore. I've never been on an island that had humans that were not civilized. Does that make sense? But I'd love yeah. to have some sort of encounter one are day. There, are there those in the that yeah, area? I think in like, not probably not in that area, but in like French Polynesia or something. I know those exist. Yeah, um, like like in the Amazon, you have the tribes in the Amazon yeah. that are known. Exactly. Yeah, I'd love to encounter one of those. That'd be really cool. I feel like that should be a bucket list item. Yeah. Yeah, that would be. There, but then at the remember, same time, think... you almost don't want to because you want to leave them like uncontacted. Yeah, yeah. that's true. Yeah, I think there's like an island in the indian ocean that's like you just it's banned like no one's allowed to go there because there's like a un non-contacted tribe and like everybody that's tried to you know make their contact with the real world for as they say they end up dying because they just it's a very hostile tribe um i see it all the time on like some instagram reel of like you know be like 10 places in the world no one's allowed to go to or something like that um but you know we we've touched on a bunch of the challenges uh with boating and like the kind of the i would i don't horror seems like too like harsh of a term um but you know those real trying times um and i'm curious what your biggest highlight is thus far with your adventures I think for for me it would be proximity to water every single morning I open my eyes I take about four steps and I jump overboard in salty turquoise water every single day um yeah that's got to be the biggest element access to swimming I can swim to shore. Sometimes I just grab my little bouet. I put my shoes, my towel in it. And then I swim to shore. I go get myself a croissant and swim back to my boat. Um, so there's definitely something about movement, you know, having a lifestyle that you're constantly moving and a lifestyle that you're constantly outside. Like right now in an Airbnb and it feels weird for me because I'm used to be on a boat where all the windows and the door is open. I'm used to be living with the outdoors 100% of the time. Um, so that's a big, big thing. And of course, the second, I think it's like that for most humans, but it's the, the connections, the people that you meet. And when you meet other sailors and you hear their stories and why they got started, it just, it's pretty magical. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Well, it makes me want to kind of at least experience sailing. So I got to then ask the question, do you know of any, like, I obviously am not going to go out and buy a boat and change my life and live on a boat but i think spending a week or 10 days on a boat like this would be fun uh what so what would you recommend for me i guess if i were to say i want to go to the caribbean i want to be on the boat for like a week i think i would first ask you what kind of experience you're looking for because of course there are some very like high-end experience where you'll be greeted by a hostess and you'll have unlimited drinks and that's possibility right for charters you can get a full-on experience, um, a very private, luxurious experience. But if you want to truly experience uh, sailing, the sailing lifestyle, there are some people who do that out there. I know some people I can recommend. And uh, as well, if you're looking for courses, because some people offer sailing courses where you can take a one-week sailing certification in Guadeloupe, for example, and then food is included and whatsoever. Oh, wow. That's awesome. That's really yeah. cool. No, thank you. Uh, do you see yourself living this way uh, for, you know, a, a decade, more than decade? Or um, do you kind of just see this as, you know, this is this time in my life type of deal? I think we're going to continue as long as this is fun and as long as this is serving us. Uh, we're really going one season at a time, right? Because every Every hurricane season, we haul out. So we always have an opportunity to say, no, we want to sell the boat, buy something more comfortable. I think we definitely, my partner and I are discussing, we definitely would like 
to buy a bigger boat. And I think we're looking at the Mediterranean. So I think we're going to sell this one in the Caribbean and then start a whole new adventure oh, wow. um, in, on the Med. And that is that is that I guess is that typical to to kind of hop around like that to different parts of the world for sailors? I don't or? I don't know. A lot of the sailors will cross oceans, right? Right, uh, right now, our boat is not. I mean, she could maybe cross an ocean. Yellowbird. Her name is Yellowbird. My vessel. Um, the thing is that she's not very comfortable for more than three people. And when you're crossing an ocean, because it's about four like the Atlantic is about 14 days, um, a crossing, you want to be at least four, maybe even six so that you can comfortably have some sleep. And that if someone is seasick or if someone is hurt, um, you have enough resources to get there. So we're just thinking if we're going to buy something new, might as well buy it in the next region we want to explore instead of buying something and then crossing it. Um, and crossing, of course, is tough on your boat as well. So it means repairing, nice. preparing it before, repairing it after. It's a lot of cost in terms of fuel, making sure you're going to have enough fuel on your boat, enough fresh water if you don't have a water maker. Um, so, yeah, these are all questions. I don't think we're we're considering crossing with friends. We have friends who need help crossing their boat. So I think we're going to be crossing an ocean next year, but not ourselves with our boat. What ocean? Oh, the Atlantic. I think we're going to cross the Atlantic in November. Where would you head to? I guess, I would just, like, uh, we would fly. So our friend is crossing from Gibraltar to oh. uh, the Caribbean. So we would fly and to probably cross. Spain, Canaries, and then, yeah. Like so, so a lot of people, that's where they, when you do cross, you probably go up into the Mediterranean, most likely. Into those yeah. ports. Because um, there are those ones also in uh east or west africa as well right that you could go to yeah yeah you can go down to cape verde and then cross from cape verde okay. um that works that works well as well but it's much easier yeah it's much easier to cross the ocean from sorry going west or going east i'm having a moment of doubt here from europe okay. to that's going east that's, that's the harder one i think Okay. okay i'm not sure anymore i would please someone right. look it up it well coming from <laughs> europe would be west right you'd be headed west from if, but if you're coming going that way it'd be east right yeah. yeah yeah so yeah one of them is harder I'm not bet. sure which yeah. one at the moment i mean the uh, titanic sunk so <laughs> you know you know the atlantic's dangerous Oh, and don't they say over there in uh, the outer banks of like North Carolina that like that, that those inlets, they had the Oregon Inlet over there is one of the most dangerous uh, like shipyards in the world. Just because. Really? Of, yeah. I did not know about that. Well. Um, it's like the tides I, and how it's like a swamp kind of. Yeah. I unfortunately uh, have to uh, cut it. I have to be that guy. I'm oftentimes, uh, well, actually I am the guy every time um, because we're, (laughs) we're starting to run out of time. Um, But we finish every one of our episodes with what we call like the final words. Um, So you being the guest, we're going to let you kind of go first. Um, and with these final words, it can like literally be anything you want. If you've written a poem you want to share, a song you like really like, if you have something you want to plug, you have a PSA, like it can be like honestly anything you'd like. Uh, but it, it's just kind of the final last thing to say. Um, so kind of with that being said, lead us off in the final words. Awesome. Thank you, Mark. And thank you so much for having me. This was a really fun conversation. Um, If you're curious about sailing, curious about digital nomads, definitely connect with me. I am everywhere. um, Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook. My handle is always just my name, which you can find probably somewhere around this podcast. I do live on Instagram, though. It's my preferred social media, so you can connect with me there. Um, And yeah, make sure that you create a life that you can't get enough of. Make sure that you dare to do those things. And remember that if you're feeling stuck right now, start, stop focusing on everything that you don't know and start focusing on 
all the things that you can learn. I love it. Thank you so much. Uh, Zach, final words. Uh, just to stick kind of with Vicky's words there. Yeah, definitely. Just keep learning. Education is power. Knowledge is power. The more we know, the better off we can be. Um, and to educate ourselves. You learned a new hobby. You learned how to sail. Why not go learn something crazy like that? Like I know Mark wants to go climb a mountain, so he's got to get all certified and do all that stuff. So we got to make sure we got to make sure he, he, he does that. You know, you're over here sailing. We got to get Mark climbing mountains. But other than that, just set your goals, set them low, set them high, reach them um, and just keep living a wonderful life. All right. I'll pass it over to you, Mark. Love it. Uh, Reverend's final words, wisdom. First off, I just want to say super thank you. Thank you so much, Vicky, for coming on, uh, talking. It was an absolute pleasure and a half to listen to your stories uh, from the getting towed by the Coast Guard to just being able to jump off the boat every morning and dip, dip your, uh, your whole body in the water. It was an absolute, I can't thank you enough for coming on and sharing all of those stories. Uh, I, I wish you the best in all of your next travels. Um, hopefully, hopefully the boat isn't too much repairs uh, for you. And so you can travel as carefree as possible. Um, but, you know, kind of that being said, thank you so much and peace out everybody. Bye.